Welcome back to the Lee Fendel House Museum. My name is Amanda and I'm the manager of interpretation here. And today we're gonna to give you a, sort of a behind the scenes glimpse at our exhibit, which opened first last year um, and then reopened actually this past March. And there's just so many stories to tell here at the Lee Fendel House, but this exhibit, um, we wanted to tell the stories of some of the women who were connected to the house uh, in the period leading up to women winning the right to vote. So uh, the exhibit is called The New Woman, uh, Life in Progressive Era Alexandria from 1890 to 1920. And we explore the lives of three women who are connected to the house during that period. And uh, one of those women, uh, Myra Lee Savalier, she actually etched her name uh, in the glass window pane here behind me. So um, we have that very personal connection to her. Um, she etches her name in 1895. Uh, and she also includes the name of her dog, Hal, a beloved dog. So we're gonna go meet Myra and some of the other women uh, in the exhibit. So we're standing here in the exhibit room for the new woman, um, and we have this introductory panel over here uh, that is going to introduce us to some of the women who lived uh, in, in the house. And I do want to talk a little bit about the Progressive Era. Like I said, it was that period roughly from 1890 to 1920, and it was just a period of change for women. Um, they were able to gain greater access to employment and education, and they were enjoying new pastimes and pursuits, including um, being involved in social clubs and athletic activities. So there are definitely a period where women are going outside the sphere of the, of the home, and they're starting to participate more in society and in politics, of course, as they're fighting for that right to vote. And there are three women, like I said, that we highlight here in the exhibit that were connected to the house. The first one is Myra, whose name we saw etched in the window. Myra Lee Savalier was one of the last members of the Lee family of Virginia to actually reside in the home. And she resided here from 1881 until 1902 with her older sister and her mother. And what's interesting about Myra is that she was uh, a celebrated stage actress. Uh, she performed in both local and traveling theater productions um, and was a member of several different acting companies. And she, she traveled all over the country, I mean, from, from New York all the way down to Texas. And that was something that was uh, you know, quite progressive for its time. She never married, she does unfortunately die in her 30s, or so she does not live to be very old, but she's certainly um, taking advantage of some of these new opportunities uh, for women at the time. And we have Maud Downham. Uh, she was actually a member of the Downham family who purchases the home uh, in 1903. Uh, from the Lee family. And Maud Downham, it was actually her brother Robert who buys the house. Um, Maud Downham, though, was quite an accomplished um, young woman. She, being the daughter of a mayor here, E.E. E. Downham, uh, she had a lot of advantages. She was able to attend preparatory school uh, up in, in Connecticut. And she enjoyed reading, she enjoyed participating in a lot of athletic activities. Um, and she does eventually end up marrying in 1907. Uh, to uh, a, into another local family. But what's interesting about her is she actually keeps a scrapbook of her time uh, in preparatory school and beyond. Um, and so she's keeping a, a lot of um, private information, uh, personal information, but also things that are of interest to the time period. So it really gives you a great glimpse into what women, young women at her age are experiencing during this time. Uh, and of course, Mae Greenwell here, she marries Robert Downham. Uh, Maud's sister, uh, brother, excuse me. And May Greenwell was also very accomplished in the arts. So like her friend Myra Lee Savalier, uh, she was actually a very accomplished singer and she also performed in a local musical theater group that was known as the Sharps and Flats. And May moves into the Lee Fendel house um, after it's purchased by her, her husband, her fiance at the time, Robert Downer. And they live here for um, a long time throughout the 1930s. But um, May Greenwell, we know from the women's equal suffrage records, she was a supporter of women's suffrage. She actually signed a petition um, demanding the right to vote um, in the state of Virginia. So again, we're able to sort of explore some of the changes in this period through, by looking uh, through the lens of these women. I do want to point out, um, women certainly did not experience this period um, in any sort of universal way. Uh, the women who were most able to benefit from the changes that are taking place in society are women like Myra, Maud, and May. 
Um, these are women who are wealthy, they're white, they're living in urban areas, um, and you know, certainly in this fight for equality, um, there was unfortunately a pronounced lack of equality among women. Um, and we're gonna touch on that again a little bit later on. So um, we're gonna move over here and we're gonna explore um, an interesting point of change for women at this time period, and it's the way they dressed. Um, and so you can see we have an example here of what became sort of almost a, a typical um, work uniform for women, um, or really for anything that they're doing outside the home. You can see the shirtwaist here at the top. This is a period shirtwaist from around 1905. Um, it would often be worn with a long skirt. Was, this one is an example of one of those what they call walking skirts. So it was meant to be um, easier to move around in. Um, you know, it's still quite long, but it doesn't have you know the huge um, you know the crinoline or the hoop skirts that a lot of us associate, of course, with the, with the older era before or the bustle. Um, and so it's a lot more easy to, to move around, uh, it's more practical. Women would sometimes pair this with a, a matching jacket to create like, a suit-like effect. See, it was considered to be uh, sort of a, a typical work day outfit or really just an everyday outfit for women um, who are going about um, their business. And so it was considered to be a lot more uh, affordable. It was mass-produced, one of the first mass-produced garments for women. Um, and it's also something that was easier to launder and just easier to um, take on and off. And so there's a lot of reasons why this became a very favorite, favored form of fashion for women um, in, the, in this period. And as part of this sort of larger uh, movement that's taking place, um, it, it's a sort of practical um, uh, clothing movement that's taking place at this time. And you can see here, as women are starting to become much more involved in athletics as well, including the bicycle craze, which is sweeping the country um, in the 1890s, there's even outfits designed um, for women to be able to more easily ride a bicycle. So this particular painting here, entitled The New Woman, shows a woman wearing um, really a, what's a pair of trousers. Um, and there also were some that were, where the, the pants were a little bit more hidden under a skirt, a little more camouflage. But this is again part of that, that whole movement that's taking place where women are participating in more activities and activities that require specialized uh, clothing. Referring back to the bicycle craze here that I mentioned, um, bicycles in the 1890s became popular among men and women as a way to more easily um, get around. But for women, it was especially empowering and liberating. Uh, it was a way for women to um, easily go places, again, outside the home, and they're not dependent on on men or the expense of a, of a car or for a man to drive them around or whatever. It's something they can do on their own and they can get from, from their work to their work to their school. Um, and it's, so it's a very, it's, it's something that Susan B. Anthony attributes to being one of the, the greatest um, advancements for women at this time, really to create um, sort of this independence. And something that we found in Mott's, one of Mott's uh, scrapbooks, was this fabulous list over here that appeared in a newspaper uh, in the 1890s. Uh, it's been beautifully uh, re recreated and restored by one of our volunteers, Rita Mattia. And it is just a list of over a hundred uh, rules, if you will, for women bicyclists. So you can take this as sort of tongue in cheek. It is, uh, in my opinion, um, also showing a little bit of pushback against women riding around on bicycles everywhere. Um, and so it's a long list that includes things like, you know, don't ride where a man would fear to wheel, um, to more things that probably are still good advice, um, like don't carry a flask. Um, so there's a, a whole list of things that women are supposed to, if they want to ride a bicycle, they should probably adhere to these rules. What I love, though, about this particular list is that Maud cuts it out and she pastes it in her scrapbook. She probably finds it pretty amusing, like a lot of us today. Um, but she has little X marks on the sides of some of these rules. And I like to think that means that she broke them, um, but we don't know for sure what, what those X marks meant. But yeah, as so women are starting to become um, more involved in physical activity, and they're actually encouraged to become involved in physical activity, um, unlike um, in the 1860s and, and um, sort of older generations where it was seen as unhealthy for women to do a lot of exercise, that is completely changing at this time period. So women are actually encouraged as part of their, um, even their schooling, to take place, to take um, part in physical um, exercise. 
So we know again, going back to Maud Downham, she went to school up in uh, Connecticut, Miss Bears Institute. And you can see um, a photograph here of the gymnasium at her school. So there are hand weights, there's um, a lot of different um, space to do different types of exercise. Oftentimes you, you hear this exercise um, referred to as calisthenics. And so they're oftentimes just using their own body weight or they're sometimes using wooden dumbbells like the ones that you see in the case here um, to do various exercises. And again, this isn't just at school. Women are encouraged to do this at home as well. So uh, there actually were a number of books, sort of how-to books that were published showing women how to um, do their own calisthenics at home. And we know that Myra Lee Sabalier uh, in the 1880s, she's actually holding calisthenics lessons here, in, right here in the Lee Fendel House. So she's advertising um, calisthenics lessons for women um, right here. So that's kind of a, a cool connection. Going back to um, Maud Downham, we know, of course, that Maud attended school, and she goes to a preparatory school up in Connecticut, like I said, but um, she does not go on to college. But there are a lot of her classmates, and there are actually a lot of women um, who are starting to attend college at this time. So um, the number of women enrolled in college does significantly increase during this era, and uh, women are able to take advantage of just acquiring a more uh, well-rounded education, more, more than they had in the past. I do want to head over here to this case. This is actually one of my favorite exhibit cases. Um, we just added it when we reopened this um, exhibit in March. And it speaks to um, the history of fashion, but also the history of women um, advocating for themselves, defending themselves in, um, from unwanted advances. The hat pin was something that was um, seen everywhere in this time period. Women's hats became uh, quite elaborate works of art, if you will. I mean, feathers, even birds, you know, stuffed birds, um, piled onto these large hats. And of course, their hairstyles were also very voluminous. So you're going to need quite a long hat pin to keep that hat affixed and in place. So um, hat pins were became longer and longer during this time period. And actually, you know, you, you look at them; they're they're actually pretty menacing looking. Um, and actually, women started using these hat pins as weapons of self defense. So, um, you know, as women, again, they're going out into the public sphere, they're traveling by themselves, um, they're becoming more independent, that, that's also seeing an increase of unwanted male attention and advances. So, um, it becomes known as sort of the hat pin menace, but women are starting to actually defend themselves using these hat pins from, um, some, from, from some of these unwanted um, male advances. So, um, that's just sort of, to me, it just makes a hat pin a thousand times more interesting. Um, and of course, as we head into the idea of women in society, uh, women are becoming much more active. Not only are they working in jobs like, um, you know, secretarial work, um, in nursing, for example, um, they're also forming clubs in society. And this is particularly for women who are wealthier. Maybe they don't, you know, they don't need to work, so they're not working outside the home in the traditional sense but they are still doing things that influence the larger public sphere. So they're forming clubs and societies that work um, towards a variety of causes and issues that women are concerned about in this period. And some of those include labor reform, um, prohibition, and of course uh, women are organizing and associating together and banding together to attain women's suffrage. So women are definitely participating outside the home in large organizations that they are advocating for change in society. Um, and like I said, women's suffrage is, um, we, we are of course this year celebrating the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we know May Greenwell who lived here in the house, uh, she was a supporter of women's suffrage. And uh, women of course um, work together um, in a variety of ways to achieve that. Um, but it was certainly um, something that brought, that brought a lot of change um, for women at the time. Now, now they're able to, to do more um, than even work in their clubs. They're able to actually cast a vote. Uh, and if you come over here, you'll see um, that women, of course, are also, in terms of working outside the home, there, there are new opportunities opening up for them. So while there were areas that were seen as, and work that was seen as traditionally female at this time, women are starting to branch out from that. Uh, I mentioned, of course, that um, Myra Lee Savalier was a stage actress. The arts were actually um, 
one of the earliest ways that women could uh, sort of break the mold and, and do things that were seen as um, maybe not uh, traditional, ladylike. Um, they're traveling around, they're, they're, they're performing on stages. So um, this is an opportunity for women to, to have a sort of a more of a sense of independence. And we know um, that Maud Downham, she, in her scrapbook, she actually saves two postcards she was sent from family members um, from the Chicago World's Fair. And of course, this is in 1893, the Chicago World's Fair taking place in Chicago, um, and it's, it's a big deal. Um, it's actually the first time that women's accomplishments are really celebrated um, at a World's Fair. So they have the Women's Building, which um, is actually on both of these postcards here, uh, and that was the, um, it was designed by a, a female architect, and like I said, it's really the first time that you have women represented in this way. They're responsible for um, decorating the building, or female artists are responsible for decorating the building, and for putting together all of the um, exhibits that are inside. And again, it's highlighting and showcasing women's contributions um, to, to the world. And I want to end um, today by talking about um, some of the changes that come towards the end of the, of the, the time period that we're talking about here. But um, talking, when we're talking about work, I do want to mention, uh, make it very clear that um, there were more women who were here at Lee Fundle House than the three that we um, focused on at the beginning. Um, we know that there were a number of African American women who are working in this house. And these are women who, they have to work. You know, for, for them, work isn't um, just sort of this privilege or something they can go out and do for some independence. Um, this is something that they're having to do to support their families. And most African-American women at this time are working uh, in domestic service. So we know that um, the Downhams here, um, May Greenwell Downham, she actually ends up uh, employing two sisters. Now these sisters are from North Carolina. So they grew up in a very rural part of the South and they're part of this sort of great migration of African Americans who are coming to the bigger cities, typically up north, and they're looking for work opportunities, um, more opportunities than they would have perhaps if they stayed um, home. And so these two sisters end up working in the house um, throughout the 19 teens um, and 20s, and uh, they're working as a cook and as a housemaid here. Uh, we also know that May uh, Maud Down, excuse me. Um, she employed um, an African-American woman named Louisa. Louisa was working for Maud Downham as a child nurse. And so for a lot of women, like I said, in this time period, who are not wealthy, who are, um, who are not white, perhaps um, they're women of color or they're recent immigrants, they are, they are having to work. So that's just a, a, a big distinction between um, some of the women who, who it was more of a, of a luxury. Um, but of course, women are contributing in many ways to um, the efforts um, during the World War One. So when World War One breaks out, and uh, women are again, they're filling um, roles such as nursing. Um, they're also starting though to work in a military and administrative position. So women um, are also filling um, jobs that were traditionally considered males. So they're actually also coming into factory jobs and farming jobs. And so women do a lot to. Um, Sort of keep the, the home fires burning here during World War One. Um, we know that May Greenwell, she was very active in a number of organizations in support of the war effort. Uh, she was, um, she sang at a number of charitable events and she would actually sing for soldiers right here um, just down the street at the Lyceum. Um, she would perform for them. Um, she also was working in a group that was really trying to um, promote food conservation during the war. So obviously a lot of limits on, on food. Um, and so she's trying to work with women, local women, to um, promote conservation and just not wasting um, food. And that's uh, just in one area where, where local women are, are working to support um, the war. And in fact, um, it is often pointed out that um, women, women's work during World War I really helped to convince um, a lot of the male politicians that they, they did deserve um, the right to vote. Um, Woodrow Wilson, who was not initially a, a supporter of women's suffrage, does eventually, when he speaks before Congress, advocating them to pass um, the 19th Amendment, he does specifically refer to the fact that women were, um, were, were, were asked to be equal partners in the war effort, and it seemed uh, unfair to deny them the right to vote at this point. But um, that's just a little overview of the exhibit, um, how these changes for women uh, 
occurred during the time period that we were um, talking about here leading up to um, women's, women's votes. And um, so I want to thank you for joining us today. And uh, we are hoping that when we eventually are able to safely reopen to the public, 